Well, good morning again. We start a new sermon series today, walking through the book of Acts. We're going to take our summers, probably for the next three to four summers, to walk through this entire book. So instead of doing it in one long uh, section, we're going to take this over our summer months for the next few years. And so we're going to walk through the first, I believe it's eight chapters this summer. And so today we're starting in the beginning, and, and I have so much I want to share with you about the introduction to the book of Acts, but uh, I don't want us to have a, a two-hour-long sermon. So I'm going to be brief, and maybe I'll follow up with a, a separate podcast to share some of the really cool things about uh, just the book of Acts, um, how it came to be, and, and why it's such a, an important book. But I'll hit on a few things here as we kind of start together. Uh, the book of Acts was written by a man named Luke. He was a physician, a doctor of his time. He served as a traveling companion to the Apostle Paul on some of his missionary journeys. The book was most likely written between 70 and 80 AD. Uh, there's more to that story, but again, don't have time. Uh, the sec this is the second of Luke's two-part work. The first was the gospel according to Luke. We have four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke's being one of the four. And, and again, this is a two-part work. He wrote the gospel, and then he wrote Acts. And, and I believe that he, as he was writing the gospel, had in mind the book of Acts. That's why I, I think he spends uh, less time on some things in, in the book of Acts. Of, of Luke, that then, and he doesn't repeat a lot in Acts, uh, because again, it's a two-part work that really should be read together. Again, more to say on that later. Uh, the gospel, it, it, Luke is a thematic writer, and, and so there's kind of a, a debate, is Luke writing biography or uh, history? And, and I would side on, uh, on the side of, he, he's more of a history writer. History writers write with a theme in mind. Biography writers are writing about a person. And so if you think he writes in biography, then the first book is all about Jesus, and the second book is really about Peter for the first half, and then Paul in the second half. And, and I think that... Um, I see why you could come to that conclusion. I just think it's not correct. Uh, this is why. Luke is a thematic writer. The whole first book themes the kingdom of God. It's all about the kingdom of God's coming, salvation coming for all people, not just Jew, but for Jew and Gentile. He writes really to a diverse audience. And in Acts, we see that. The theme of the book is now the kingdom of God as it's been fulfilled by Jesus. Now it is, uh, now, now it is spread out through preaching, teaching, and discipleship. So the two themes, the one theme under the two books is the kingdom of God. And that lines up more with uh, history writing, especially of, of the Greek narrative of that time. And, and so we're going to see, again, Jesus and his kingdom inaugurated in the Gospels, Jesus' church and his kingdom now expanded to the end of the earth. That's another thing. Oh, I'll get into that a little later. Um, Let's see. Man, there's so many things. What, what do you say? Well, how about this? History is focused on time and theme. Again, I've told you it's about the kingdom of God. And this is important. We're going to hit this in the text today. Jesus says, you will be my witnesses. Where? From Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Again, Luke's book of Acts is going to now show us that reality. It's going to take us from Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Again, more on that in a moment. Luke writes the book for a man named Theophilus. And there's a lot of conjecture about who Theophilus was. Uh, I believe, and many scholars believe, that he most likely was the person who commissioned Luke's book, The Gospel and Acts. Uh, it, we have to be very careful uh, to think about our current book reality and not push that onto 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, the book industry was not an industry. It, most people, if you wanted uh, a book written, it, so if you were a wealthy person and you wanted information, you would find someone who liked to write and, hit, and uh, someone who would seek out information uh, to, to write a book. You would commission them to do the work that you didn't want to do. And, and that usually would end with a book written for you. And if you're wealthy enough, you might have a few copies made. Remember, they don't have copy machines. They don't have the printing press. Every book had to be handwritten uh, to, be, to be multiplied. And so they might have a few copies made for their friends. 
a, a, a book would only have more prominence if, if one of the major libraries would pick it up and then print it themselves. And there were book dealers, but again, uh, to, to have a book uh, make any money uh, for all that writing, you had to be a bestseller. It had to be something that was really going to have traction. And so if you thought that, then maybe a book dealer would, would buy that and have copies made to be sold. But most likely, that is who Theophilus is. He is the person who's commissioning this book, and we'll read about him in a moment. Uh, Luke 1, uh, I'd like to take us there for just a minute to, to get a little insight on Luke before we read Acts 1. Luke chapter 1 verse 1 says this, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, Again, he's giving us hints here. He's not saying inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a biography of Jesus. He's saying the things that have been accomplished. Verse 2, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having following all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. So most likely, Theophilus was a Christian and who, who was looking for assurance. I, I, need, I need the whole story. I, I need to know uh, what, who is this Jesus more fully and, and what has he done and, and what's the trajectory from Jesus. What is this church? What, what does this really look like? And so that is why Luke is writing for Theophilus. All right. That's enough. Let's just get into it. We have so much to cover today. Acts 1. Let me read Acts 1 through 11. This is going to be our text today, and then we're going to dive in. Luke writes this, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they, had came, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Father God, may you be honored by the preaching of your word, the word that you have inspired, the word that you have spoken to human authors as they wrote, for that time and that season, and yet you, through them, have written to all people in all places and all times. May we hear with open ears. May our hearts, in their hardened fashions, be softened to be transformed by the Holy Spirit. Father, bring into salvation those whom you are calling. Transform those who you have called into the image of Jesus today through the preaching of your word and the conviction of the Spirit. We pray this in the name of Jesus. We said, Amen. Let's walk through our text. Uh, I'm going to take it in two big sections, verse 1 through 5, and then verses 6 through 11. So the first section is really the introduction of the letter. Let's look at verse 1. In the first book, again, Luke's Gospel, O Theophilus, again, he's writing to most likely the person who's commissioning this work, and he tells us what the first book was about. In the first book, I have dealt with all that Jesus all that Jesus, again, even John says in his gospel, if we wrote about all that Jesus did, you, you couldn't fill all the books in the world. So all is all that, all, that, all that has a purpose, right, in Luke's writing. He dealt with all that Jesus began to do and to teach. And that do and teach has a theme. What is it? The kingdom of God. He is dealing with his primary focus, all that Jesus. Again, that could you could say, oh, see, it's all about Jesus. It's biography. But that's not, what does he say? All that Jesus began to do and to teach. This is a theme. Jesus, hear this. Jesus spoke 
He taught, and Jesus lived it out. He did. That's what we need today. People that don't just speak, people that speak and then do what they speak. We need less people who speak and then do uh, the opposite. Not hypocrites. And again, none of us are perfect. We're all in a process, if you're saved, in a process of sanctification. But we want to match our words. And that's just not our preachers. That's everyone, every disciple of Christ. Jesus spoke and Jesus lived it out. His words matched his walk. Oh, you should write that down. His words matched his walk. Do your words match your walk? Verse 2. He dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Just a few things. Luke's gospel ends at the ascension of Jesus. The facts of the ascension are this. Jesus was taken up, which is weird. We're going to get to that in a few moments. Number two, Jesus not only was taken up, before he was taken up, he gave commands, orders to be obeyed. One of the things you have to ask yourself, is Jesus just a good teacher? Is Jesus just someone who gives me good quotes to live by? Or is Jesus my king? And if he's my king, he's my Lord. And I am subservient to him. I bow the knee in every area and aspect of life. I obey every command because he is the ruler of every aspect of my life. Jesus is taken up. Jesus gives commands. And he gives commands specifically to the apostles. The word apostle in the Greek means a messenger. And these are men that he had chosen. Jesus had many disciples, many followers, but he had 12 that were his closest, that he poured his life out to, which we call the 12 apostles. And out of the 12, he had three that were the closest, Peter, James, and John. Friends, we live in a world today where everyone wants equality, everyone wants to be treated the same. And on one aspect, that's what we want in a broad sense. But the reality is, even Jesus didn't treat all his disciples the same. He chose 12 to be intimately with him, to learn in every aspect of life. And he had three that were most intimately with him, that he poured out his life toward and to. Are you discipling everyone? Or are you so afraid that you're not going to treat people with equality, that maybe it's your kids, so I've got to make sure that I do the same for everyone. And you're so anxious and, and fearful that you're going to mess it up. Friends, that's just self-worship. I'm afraid that they're not going to love me. I'm afraid that I might mess this up. Friends, just pour out your life. And you should have close friends. You should choose those who would, not, not because it's comfortable and convenient, maybe you share all things in affinity. Maybe you have some friends that don't share things with affinity, so they give you a different point of view. So they can actually teach and you can learn from. All right. Verse 3. He, Jesus, presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proof. Jesus now resurrected. Remember, Jesus incarnates. Jesus is not Jesus eternally. He is the Son of God eternally. Jesus is the man he becomes when he takes on human form. Jesus does not exist before the baby in the manger is a reality. Now Jesus, his human name, as he takes on from his ultimate divinity, takes on humanity. He, he, he incarnates, he lives, and he dies. He dies a brutal death. You might be able to be resurrected from a heart attack. You might be able to be resurrected from some trauma. You're not resurrected from the brutal beatings, whippings, crucifixion, bleeding out, stabbed with a spear to make sure that he's dead and buried. No one resurrects from that except the one who God the Father, by the power of the Spirit, brings back to life. He presents himself alive to his disciples. Why? Because he wants them to have assurance and confidence of who he is and what they're going to believe. He was alive after his many sufferings, and he's alive by many proofs. He is with them, teaching them. He even makes them breakfast. Wouldn't you like to have Jesus make you breakfast? Would have been the best breakfast ever. Jesus is alive and among them after his resurrection for 40 days. Speaking about what? 
about the kingdom of God. Look at it. Alive to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Luke is giving you the hints to the theme of his book. It's about the kingdom. Jesus inaugurated it in his life, death, and resurrection. Now the church is going to expand it as it preaches and lives, as it, as it speaks words and walks a walk. Verse 4. And while staying with them, he ordered them. Okay, Jesus is giving, again, commands. What is that command? Part one, do not depart from Jerusalem. Stay. Be patient. Be praying. Something is coming that you need. You cannot fulfill the mission on your own, in your own strength, in your own power, in your own wisdom, in your own cunning, in your own might. You need something for this mission. You are to not depart, but you are to wait. Let me just speak to you this morning. Some of you are not patient. You want what you want, and you want it now. I want to get married. So you find the first person who gives you attention. I want a career. So you jump at the first opportunity without thinking it through. I want a house and a car, things that give me security and comfort. So you purchase too quickly. And now you're saddled with poor choices. And, and the most frustrating thing is that you blame God. God, I, I thought you gave me this marriage. God, I, I, what, what, well, I, I, thought, I thought I was doing what you wanted me to do. Did you even check in with him? Or did you just say, hey, thanks for giving it to me? So many of us want God to bless our mess. Friends, this is the reality of our impatience. And again, not seeking wise counsel, godly counsel. There's no reason to rush into things. There's a reason to be patient, to wait, to pray, to seek the face of God. Some of you even want good things, God things, but you're not patient. You want a ministry. You want influence, but you're not willing to grow, not willing to learn humility, not learning to learn, learn wisdom, not willing to, to gain experience in the trenches before you get to the platform. May we be a patient people. May we be a people that's more known for our patience and for our humility to be in prayer than we are to just be about work. Wait, he says. Wait for what? Wait for the promise of the Father. Again, Jesus tells them in Luke chapter 24, you will be clothed with power from on high. You need a supernatural power to do what I'm calling you to do. And see, again, so many of us have distorted this. That's right, I need supernatural power to, to, to heal the blind and heal the lame and to speak to thousands. I need supernatural power. Friends, sure, that will take supernatural power, but that's not the power we're talking about. Friends, it takes a lot of power to be patient to a toddler. It takes a lot of power to be patient, to be loving in a relationship where you don't experience love. It takes patience and humility and confidence to stand up for Christ in a room full of people who think you're foolish because of your beliefs. That is the power the Spirit is going to give. The Spirit is going to put a power in us that will accomplish the mission of God, not our mission, not our purposes, not our plans. God's purposes, God's plans, God's mission. This is the promise of the Father. We think of Joel 2, 28-32. I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and on your sons and your daughters, on the old and the young. But also we look at Isaiah 32 and 34. Again, I will pour out my Spirit, God says. We think of Ezekiel 11 in chapter 36. He will give a new heart and a new spirit. He will take our hearts of stone and bring them and turn them into hearts of flesh. This is the promise of the Father. Again, he... Jesus himself told his disciples this. That's what he says, which he said you heard from me, verse 5, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. 
John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. It was an acknowledgement of sin and a need for cleansing and forgiveness. And again, John's baptism wasn't necessarily new. This is what the Israelites were supposed to be doing with sacrifice. The problem is the sacrificial system and the priests had become so corrupted. That's why Jesus went into the temple with a whip and, 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 and turned over tables and said, you've taken my father's house and turned it into a den of corruption. You're, you're, you're selling things for a profit, for, for a ridiculous profit, instead of allowing people to come and repent and to make sacrifice for the cleansing of their souls. John steps outside of the perverted system and begins to baptize people in places like the River Jordan where they acknowledge sin and their need for cleansing and forgiveness. But praise be to God, a better baptism has come. A baptism where we don't need to go again to the temple and make sacrifice. We don't need to go again to the river after we've sinned to be washed clean. Instead, we have the baptism of the Spirit, an actual permanent salvation, a work of redemption and reconciliation and empowerment. When the Spirit baptizes, He seals. That's Ephesians 1 and 2. You should read it sometime. You cannot lose what the Spirit has given you in this baptism. If you get saved again, you're acknowledging the Spirit's weakness, which again, he has none. It, 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 think about this. You can have apathy. You can turn away from the reality of your salvation, but you don't need to come back. There's no such thing as a third birth. There's the first birth, your physical birth, and there's your second birth, your spiritual birth into Christ. Nowhere in the scriptures does it mention a third birth, a fourth, a fifth birth. I need to come to the altar and get saved again. That's foolishness. You either weren't saved or you are saved and you just need to repent and trust, believe and hope in the work of the Spirit. You need repentance and obedience. Let me give you a quick summary of this first section. Luke and his gospel wrote an account of what Jesus taught and did. And now, in this account, the book of Acts, he's writing about what the church taught and what the church did, all focused on the big theme of the kingdom of God, a kingdom rooted in the power of God, which will be given to kingdom participants for a purpose. What purpose? We're about to see in section number two. Let's look at verse six. So when they had come together, so this is Jesus and his, it's 11 apostles because Judas the 12th betrayed Jesus on the night uh, of his betrayal uh, leading to his crucifixion. He, he, he hung himself, killed himself, and so now there's 11 apostles. When Jesus and the apostles had come together, the, they asked him, this is the apostles, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? I love this. This has been the, this has been, Really, not just the apostles. This is the entire breadth of Jesus' ministry. You're here, Messiah is going to... The, the, the Messiah was all about the minds of Israelites. Again, suffering, uh, exile, suffering, the destruction of Israel, the destruction of uh, uh, Judah, uh, just seeing, uh, being drug off to Assyria, drug off to Babylon, coming back and, and just having a, a, you know, a poor temple, a poor city. Uh, not great, and then being oppressed, brought into the Roman Empire, and being oppressed greatly through taxation. So again, in every heart of, uh, of the Israelites, they're wondering, when is Messiah coming? And is Messiah going to restore Israel to, to, to its greatness? Are, we, are you going to make Israel great again? Because we all want to be on top, don't we? And we'll all follow those who would make us on top. And Jesus' response in verse 7 is interesting. He says to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. Notice that he doesn't say, No, that's not what I'm going to do. There is going to be a restoration of Israel. Praise God that every one of us Gentiles is grafted into the branch of Israel. Praise be to God. Praise be to God for his plans to choose a lowly people like Israel, thousands of years ago, and to walk with them out of Egypt in deliverance, to walk with them into the wilderness, to, to, to give them commands and, 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 and a people and a theocracy to live by. Now, the book of the Old Testament 
reveals over and over how they turned away from God, which led to their eventual exile, which led to the presence of God leaving the temple. But that inaugurates Jesus to come. And when Jesus comes, he does not just come for the Jew. He comes for the Jew and the Greek, the Jew and the Gentile, for all people in all places of all times. And that's, again, a major theme of Luke's book. Salvation is for all. Jesus does not address the when. He addresses the Father. The Father has it all fixed. He is the authority. He is the one who has a master plan. Trust the master plan. You don't need to know the plan. If you know the plan, you'll mess it up. What you need to do is trust. And in fact, there is something for you to do. We're going to get to it in the next verse. But before I move on to there, really what Jesus is saying is, this is not your focus. Turn your eyes away from what you think you need to be concerned about, when will we be restored? And instead, think about the mission. Friends, we're 2,000 years after this moment in time. But you wouldn't know it, would you, by what you find in Christian bookstores or on Amazon. We have more books, more podcasts, more blog posts about end times and end time predictions. Friends, this is why, just personally, I just don't engage in that stuff. So if you want to come talk to me about Revelation and how you see Russia and Israel and blah, 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 friends, I'll just be real honest. I just have no desire for that. Why? Because Jesus says it's not for us to know. So why do we keep trying to figure it out? We have other things to be concerned about. What does he say? Verse 8. But, again, here's what we need to be concerned about. Here's what we need to be focused on. But you will receive power. Here's your aim. Here's your focus. Here's your mission. You will receive. Before we even get to what we'll receive, just hear those words. You will receive it. You will not earn it. You will not produce it by your own achievements or your own willpower you will receive it as a gift. This is the gift of God. He gifts you salvation. And in that salvation, that regeneration, that transformation, he gives you a power greater than you will ever know. If you would only tap into the Spirit's power, what does that mean? you got to stop working in your own power. How do I know if I'm working on my own power? How stressed are you? How anxious are you? How upset and angry are you? Those are the fruit of man-made, self-willed power. The fruit of the Spirit is joy, is love, is rest, is peace. There's a peace in your patience. There's a trust in your gentleness. But you will receive power. Pastor Sean will preach out in a few weeks. Tongues is not the power. It was the sign that the power had come. Power not to, not to speak to, to millions on platforms and have fancy titles. Not the power to, to, to see the, make the blind see and the lame walk. Although God can do that and God does that in the book of Acts. Why? To reveal his power that's more powerful than that. And that is the power to save. The power to transform. The power to take that hardened heart and to make it soft again. It's the power that the apostles and every disciple needs to to boldly stand, to boldly speak, and to boldly die. Stop looking for the power to fuel your plans and start looking for what God's plan is and how he gives you the power to have boldness and confidence in your faith, in your trust, in your hope. You will receive power. When? When the Holy Spirit comes upon you. A baptism, an immersion, a transformation. And what are the results of receiving this powerful baptism? He says it. And you will be my witnesses. You will be. This is not a suggestion. This is not a request. It's not even an order or a command. It is a fact. If you have been baptized by the Spirit, which means you've been saved by Him, regenerated, so your eyes can see, your ears can hear the truth of the gospel. 
It implants into your heart and takes that stone heart of sin and rebellion and softens it to the righteous will of God. You will be then, what? My witnesses. Here's where I think the church gets a little sideways. And again, it's for a good reason. But the problem is we've put witness with evangelism. And we put it in evangelism in a way that means I gotta have a strategy. I gotta, I gotta know the Romans road, or I gotta have the right tracks, or I gotta have the right script so I can speak the gospel. And yes, we do need to know the gospel to speak the gospel. So those tools have a place. But friends, witness is not just knowing the right track, knowing the right script, speaking something, and then going, okay, I did my part, now I can go on. Witness is a reality of all of life. Think about it. When we call a witness into a courtroom, we're not asking them to speak a script. We're not asking them to to speak, uh, uh, give us a track. We're asking them to give us a real encounter, a real description of their experience. A person is called to be a witness who experiences a specific event through their senses, through their sight, through their hearing, through their feeling. Through, again, the senses. It's a person who experiences. We don't call a witness who wasn't there. They're not a witness. Oh, we're going to call Johnny to the stand. Johnny, if you were there, would you tell us what you think you would have saw? That'd be foolishness. We call people who have experienced something so they can speak accordingly. A witness is a person who experiences a specific event and then speaks of their experience. That is a witness. Are you a witness? Have you experienced the saving work of Jesus? And if you have, are you telling people about it? Again, if you've experienced salvation, if you've experienced the baptism of the Spirit in regenerated life, if you've if you felt the cleansing forgiveness of all your sin, if you if you felt the, the love of God the Father as he calls you into relationship with him as a son or a daughter, friends, there is no greater news. If you not only can understand the gospel from a point of knowledge and words, but understand it emotionally, you'll share it. Because it's better than all the restaurants you keep telling me about. It's better than the essential oils you keep trying to hawk to me. It's better than your juice cleansing program. It's better than your Traeger smoker. It's better than your refinance program or anything else. The gospel is the best news ever because it gives you freedom in the forgiveness of your sins. It gives you identity, worth, and value, which is what we're all longing for. And it gives you purpose. Something to live for, not only in the here and now, but for your eternity. It is the best news. And if you've been saved, you will be witness. The apostles were those who experienced the ministry of Jesus. Next week we'll talk about the apostle that they choose to be Judas' replacement and the qualifications of that, that that person was a witness of the ministry of Jesus. The Gospel of Luke and the other Gospels serve as a witness for those of us who have experienced the accomplished work of Jesus in our salvation. It gives our salvation understanding. That's why we love this book because it serves as a witness to help us understand what has happened to us in our salvation. Do you believe this book is a witness? Do you long to hear it speak to you? To tell you the story of your salvation, the story of your beginning, the story of your struggle, the story of your hope, the story of your future. Do you believe it? Do you trust in it? Verse 8. He ends by not just saying you will receive power when, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and then the result, you will be my witnesses. He tells them where, and again, Luke is writing this to give a theme of his book. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, 
and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Witnesses in Jerusalem, the epicenter. This is where Christ dies in his crucifixion, is resurrected, speaks for 40 days to the disciples, is ascended to his throne in heaven at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning over his kingdom, which is coming in fullness. Jerusalem. And it expands out to Judea and Samaria, to the outskirts, and even to the half-breeds, the Samaritans, those who were half-Jew and half-Gentile. What does that mean? It means distorters of the truth are brought in. And then, to the end of the earth. Not the ends. If it was the ends of the earth, which many of us say, ends of the earth, again, you have to understand some some history, Roman Empire culture. The ends of the earth were the extension of the Roman Empire. that They ruled to the ends, plural, of the earth. Africa, Middle East, Northern Europe. But when you say to the end, singular, of the earth, you do not mean the ends, you mean the epicenter of what was the known earth, which was the Roman Empire. Look at the book of Acts. Jerusalem, chapters 1 through 7. Judea and Samaria, chapters 8 through 11. In fact, just look real quick. I don't, won't have it on the screen. I'll just read it to you. Chapter 8, this is when Saul, who, who we know as Paul, uh, Saul approved of the execution of Stephen. And it says in chapter 8, And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. There again, part 2, chapter 8 through 11. And what happens in chapter 11? The Gentiles are brought in. The church of Antioch, the first, what is known as predominantly Gentile church. Chapters 11 through 28 is really about the Gentiles coming to faith. And what happens in chapter 28, verse 16? Paul ends up in Rome. Chapter 28, just let me read it for you. Chapter 28, let me read verse 28. Therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. He, this is Paul, Paul lived there, this is in Rome, Paul lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. There's the summary of Luke's book. If it was about Paul, he, he would have, because he wrote after Paul died. So he would have written the end of Paul. But see, he wasn't writing a biography on Paul. He was writing a history of the church. Specifically, the expansion of the kingdom from Jerusalem and the epicenter of Jewish religion out to Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Not the ends, but to the epicenter, to Rome itself to the emperor himself. And what does Paul do? Paul does what Jesus does. He speaks and he does. He's proclaiming the kingdom of God and he's doing it at his own expense. Verse 9. And when he had said these things, this is Jesus, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Again, can we just be honest? It's so weird. Anyone have the power to fly? Now, here's the problem with us today in 2020. We have what's called the movies, right? Neo and the Matrix is flying around with all his power. You've got all the superhero movies. You've got the, the, all the Marvel franchises. So uh, flying is not beyond our imagination. But can you believe 2,000 years ago? They don't have airplanes. They don't have anything that goes in the sky except rocks and slingshots. Spears, right? Boom. And all of a sudden, a guy among you is like, we'll see you later. Peace. So high that clouds just take him up. And I think you'd be like the, like the apostles. What does it say in verse 10? While they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stand beside them. You'd be gazing too if you just saw one of your closest friends, the person you believe is Savior and Lord, to now be flying. You'd be, you'd be just staring dumbfounded. Okay, it was one thing for him to be resurrected. 
because I'm alive, so I can kind of understand. I, I mean, I don't understand how he died such a brutal death and, and came back from that. I mean, that's gotta be the power of God. And I watched him raise Lazarus from the dead, and that was crazy. But I, you know, I kind of I kind of thought, well, maybe, maybe Lazarus was just in the tomb. I don't know. I'm just trying to work this out mentally, scientifically, I don't quite understand. But the dude just flew. He didn't have a catapult. He didn't even jump. He just Ooh, what in the world? You'd be doing the same thing. So don't harp on the apostles. While they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, possibly angels, messengers of God. We're not sure. Verse 11. It's not important who they are. It's important what they say. Verse 11. And said, men of Galilee. Again, all of the uh, these 11 disciples were all Galileans. The only one, disciple of Christ in the 12 that wasn't a Galilean was Judas. He's dead. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Why do you stand looking? You have a mission. He just told you, go, wait, and witness. Wait for the Spirit's power. Witness through your experience, your salvation and transformation as boldness comes upon you to preach. Timid Peter, who couldn't handle a little girl calling out his faith and who betrays Christ, who, who renounces Christ in the moment of Christ's suffering, now becomes bold Peter who preaches. Bold Peter, who will one day lose his life because of his faith as he's crucified upside down. Witness and experience your salvation and transformation. Witness and then proclaim your salvation and transformation and its trajectory, which is what? The kingdom of God. And be ready to witness until the return of Jesus. The mission isn't indefinite. The mission has an end. The end is known by the Father. Jesus is coming again. Reverse fly down. He lands every time. Better than SpaceX. Do you believe it? Many Christians don't believe it anymore. A lot of theologies that, that, that was all just good advice and we're supposed to bring in, we're supposed to usher in utopia, we're supposed to cure racism, we're supposed to cure all the isms. How's that going for you? It's not. Where's your hope? Do you believe he's coming again? And do you believe it could be now? I'll tell you if you believe it. How do you know? How are you living? Do you live with any expectation? If I looked at your life, if I looked at just this past week in the events of your life, would there be any, any urgency to proclaim the gospel? Would there be any urgency to live out the gospel, to steward your life in a way that if you knew Christ was coming next week, friends, you would live in a way that's different than last week. Do you have any urgency in your life? Do the commands of Christ drive you to worship, drive you to dependence, drive you to your knees to read this book, to absorb its wisdom, to cry out in the Spirit for empowerment in your daily life, in the way you raise your children, in the way you, 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 you love your spouse, in the way you love your neighbors, in the way you work and steward your life for the glory of God? Here's the big point. If you've been baptized by the Spirit, which means you've been saved, then you will be my witnesses. Jesus is speaking to the 11 apostles, but he's speaking to all Christians. You will be my witnesses doesn't mean you will sell everything you own and move to China. It doesn't mean you will spend the majority of your days and your hours preaching on the side of the street or uh, becoming a vocational minister of the gospel. It means you will experience God, witness, and proclaim what you've experienced in your home, at your work, when you play, around your friends, around your family, around anyone who God puts you in touch with. Are you a witness? If you've been saved, you've been 
called. And it's not a call that you can accept. It's a call that you will be. Are you witness? What are you witness to? Are you more a witness of the things of this world? The cravings of this world? The lifestyle of this world? Or are you a witness of Jesus? What have you witnessed? What have you experienced with your senses? You know, this, this whole thing, uh, the posters behind me, witness the supernatural. Hear it. See it. Feel it. You have all witnessed the supernatural. And when you, this is the problem. When you think about the supernatural, you only think about blind people seeing and lame people walking, dead people being raised again. Friends, if you would look in the mirror and see your salvation is greater than all of those. Your salvation is the greatest supernatural miracle that's ever taken place. But you don't believe it. Why? Because you're all secret Arminians. You all think that you've brought something to the table. That I, well, I was a good person, so I kind of, I kind of, it was me and Jesus together. You know, we kind of flew the plane together. In fact, now the way I look at it, I'm kind of the pilot of this thing. I'm really doing a lot. Jesus is my co-pilot. You see how that foolishness comes about? Your salvation is the greatest supernatural miracle that you ever know. And it's not just your salvation. Your daily sanctification is supernatural. It's the power of God within you. Oh, that you would understand that. Oh, that you would press into that. Your transformation is is miraculous. Every moment of your sanctification is an opportunity to worship as you are patient with your children, as you are loving to your spouse, as you are gentle with the people that, that yell at you and, and, and even oppress you. And in that, you're not boasting yourself. You're boasting, as Pastor Caleb said last week, in Christ and his cross. It was that which secured my salvation. That which he gifted to me. What are you witnessing in the daily activities of your life? What are you witnessing in the reading of this word? Is it just a check off a Bible reading program? Are you witnessing truth, witnessing life, witnessing the supernatural, allowing the truth to guide you, to assure you, to inform you, to lead you? What are you witnessing in your experience and proclamation in life together as you gather with other Christians, as you have a relationship with other Christians? Are you seeing God at work? Are you seeing the supernatural calling out our salvation and transformation? Uh, is that witness leading you all to worship or just to be better? Just I just need a better book on marriage, need a better book on parenting, need a better wor- book on, if I could just read that, I could be better. There's no empowerment of the Spirit in that. It's a lot of you. What are you witnessing? What are you proclaiming in the various aspects of your daily life? Are you a truthful witness to Jesus and his kingdom? Witness. The Greek word is martus. It's where we get the word martyr. When we think of a martyr, we think of someone who dies for their faith. A witness is someone who will speak up for what they've experienced, even if it costs them their life. Stephen, the first martyr in the book of Acts, speaks the gospel, proclaims the gospel, and the religious Jewish leaders stone him to death. He was a witness. A witness isn't just a Christian who dies. A witness is a Christian who dies specifically because they would not renounce the faith that they had witnessed, the faith that they serve witness to, the faith that they live, the faith that they proclaim. Are you a witness for Jesus? Are you a witness for his gospel? Are you a witness for his kingdom? Again, if you've been filled with the Spirit, regenerated by the Spirit in the moment of your salvation? The answer is yes, you will be my witness. So are you a truthful witness, even unto death? Jesus' words matched his walk. Peter's words matched his walk. Not perfectly. He needed repentance, just like we do. Needed sanctification. But his words matched his walk, and it led him to his death, crucified upside down. Paul's words matched his walk. It led him to Rome, where he was beheaded for his faith. Many Christians throughout the last 2,000 years have been martyred 
as witness to their faith. All were witnesses and martyrs for the kingdom of God. Friends, don't be a shady witness. You know what I'm talking about? The person that shows up in court with the, with the neck brace on and all the, uh, three hours later they're playing basketball in the court down the street. Don't just be a witness on Sunday morning. Don't just be a witness at life group or when a few Christians gather together. Be a witness where it matters. Be a witness in your home, among your extended family that, that aren't Christians, in your work, even if it's a hostile environment. Be a witness. Be even a martyr. Friends, most of you, specifically in America, aren't anywhere close to martyrdom, yet we sure do act like it. Be a witness. Empowered by the Spirit. Bold and confident. Be God's witness. A witness doesn't make the decision. A witness speaks clearly and confidently about what they've experienced. You don't need a track. You don't need steps. You need to own your story with Jesus at the beginning, in the center, and at the end. Be a witness to every person in every area and aspect of your life, speaking and sharing of the supernatural that you've experienced, the salvation and sanctification of God. And then live according to what you've experienced, acting like Jesus, loving, caring, serving the people around you. Be witness. Be light. Let your words match your walk. Father God, I pray that we would hear. I pray that we would respond. I pray that we would hear the words of Isaiah chapter 6 when God says, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah says, Here am I. Send me. God, you might call some to, to the far ends of the earth. But for most of us, you're calling us to our homes, calling us to our marriages, calling us in our parenting, calling us in our daily work and habits, calling us in our cities where we have roots to be witness of the gospel. We have witnessed your gospel in the incarnation, life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus found in this word. We have witnessed your salvation through our forgiveness and our freedom. We have witnessed your sanctification through the transformation of the Spirit ongoing day by day, longing for the completion of Jesus when we see him face to face. So we pray that we would take that experiential witness and we will become proclaimers, witnesses who share by speaking of that experience, by living according to that experience, by living like Jesus. Empower us, Holy Spirit. Help us know when we're running in our own power. Help us know when we have apathy or neglect or where the longings of the world call us to be witness for a distortion, a kingdom of this world instead of your kingdom. Help us, Lord, to have our words match our walk. And may they be your words. And may they mirror the walk of Christ. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.